Hi, my name is Mark Chavez, and I'm the host of Let's Make a Horror, a podcast where three comedians try to make a horror short film. <laughs> oh, why am I laughing like a ghost? This is scary for exactly a different reason than I thought it would be. It's, it is the hardest thing we've ever done. But we're not alone. When we run into trouble, we consult Hollywood horror experts, people who have worked on everything from The Blair Witch Project to... Leprechaun. To be clear, this film has 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, so... <laughs> <laughs> Let's make a horror everywhere you get your podcasts. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Before we start today's episode, I'm excited to share with you a project that the team here at The Big Story has been working on for the past several months. It is a new podcast. It's called In This Economy, and it's hosted by me, and it's a look at how the systems that we live in create our financial problems. This is a personal finance podcast, but it's not one that tells you you're doing it wrong. It tells you how the system has done all of us wrong and how you can hack away at it and still achieve what you're after. Even, yeah, in this economy. Think of it as the big story, but about your wallet. There are ways that you might be able to own a home or buy a car or take a vacation or even afford to raise a child despite everything going on around us. We'll show you why those things have gotten so unaffordable and then we'll show you how to deal with it. It's called In This Economy. The trailer is out now wherever you get your podcasts. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. And if you want to go and subscribe or follow or whatever your favorite podcast app lets you do, you will get a little teaser next week, and then episodes start weekly on November 2nd. Go check it out in this economy coming November 2nd. I'll be brief today, because any facts that I give you may be proven wrong by the time you hear this. If you have been trying to follow the Israel-Hamas war from Canada, you know exactly what I mean. Reliable information is hard to come by, even for experienced reporters who are in the region, as you'll hear today. What can be examined is the big picture, where we are and where we could be going. A decades-long conflict coming to a violent head. A president visiting an unstable region appealing for civilian aid. Two sides that cannot back down even while officials around the world call for ceasefire. And now, perhaps, as you listen to this, a looming massive ground offensive by Israel into Gaza, an unprecedented move that would escalate the conflict, perhaps drawing in other nations, and raise the entire world's threat level. Where does this war go from here? Who else might fight in it? What happens next? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Greg Karlstrom is the Middle East correspondent for The Economist, as well as the author of How Long Will Israel Survive? The Threat from Within. He joins us right now from Dubai. Hello, Greg. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. And I want to ask you at the start to kind of uh, set the tone for the information we're discussing today. Uh, when I ask you, someone who's experienced in the region, to tell me what's happening in Gaza right now, how difficult is that question to accurately answer? It is difficult. I mean, people talk about the fog of war, but I think this war is particularly impenetrable at the moment. Start with the fact that uh, journalists can't enter. Gaza. If you're not already there, you can't get in because the border crossings are closed, and that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future. Obviously, there are local journalists already in Gaza who are doing their jobs right now under the most impossible of circumstances, but they're, they're part of the story now. They're trying to do their jobs and, and simultaneously worry about their families and try to move their families to safety. Mm -hmm. uh, they are struggling with the same sorts of uh, electricity outages and difficult communications that everyone else in Gaza is struggling with. So it's an incredibly difficult place for them to try and report from at the moment. And then 
for the other millions of people in Gaza, uh, it's the same thing. It's it's very difficult to get any information out of there because the the situation is just so dire there, and it's so hard for people to get in touch with the outside world. On Tuesday, depending on who you were listening to and and when you were doing it, either Israel callously blew up a hospital with no regard for civilian life and killed 500 people, uh, or a militant rocket misfired and struck a parking lot near the facility, causing relatively minimal damage. Um, Do we know which one is true yet? We don't definitively know which one is true. We don't even know uh, an exact number of of casualties from this explosion, let alone who caused it. So I can say that, you know, on the one hand, the Israeli army certainly has a track record of lying about these things. It did that last year uh, when Israeli soldiers shot Shireen Abu Akhle, a Palestinian journalist in the occupied West Bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, they initially denied that it was them. They they put out a very convoluted story about how it was Palestinians that shot her. They later admitted that it was Israeli soldiers. On the other hand, you can also say that Hamas has a history of lying about many things as well. Right. So uh, I wouldn't put much faith in general in, in official statements. And then we're trying to go on what it is that we can prove here, what it is that we can check. And What I will say is that the circumstantial evidence that has emerged so far, uh, I think, points towards the fact that this is not likely to have been an airstrike. We've seen photos and videos uh, that came out this morning. So uh, in daylight, of course, this happened uh, on on Tuesday night, but um, we saw photos that that emerged on Wednesday morning, uh, which showed the, the impact site at the hospital. And it showed an extremely small crater Uh, It showed that cars 10 meters away from from the center of the explosion were barely damaged or not damaged at all. Hmm. Uh, It it didn't show the characteristics of an Israeli airstrike. I've seen the aftermath of of Israeli airstrikes in Gaza, and they are much bigger. The craters are much bigger. The damage is much bigger. So it doesn't seem consistent with a, a bomb dropped from an Israeli jet. That is not conclusive. That is not definitive. That is based on a handful of, of, of photos and videos that we've seen so far. Sure. Um, and I don't want to draw any definitive conclusions from that. But I think that's pointing in the direction of that this was perhaps not an Israeli airstrike. As you mentioned, everyone is finding it so difficult to get up-to-date information that is accurate. Do you have simply any advice uh, for people who are listening here uh, back in Canada and are trying to keep up with what's going on but do not want to get sucked into misinformation? I mean, I think the the first piece of advice, unfortunately, is just not to immediately trust anything that you see on the internet, certainly (laughs) not on social media. And that is always the case uh, in war. That is certainly the case in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But I think the the situation has become worse in recent years. I mean, I find it personally much harder to find reliable information, say, on Twitter now than mm-hmm. I found it several years ago. And there's a lot of stuff that immediately comes out that with time becomes a bit clearer. And this, this uh, explosion at the hospital last night is a good example of that, where the initial reports were were very definitive that this was an Israeli strike that had killed several hundred Palestinians, and then those numbers shot up to 500 and to 800. And it was at about that point where, you know, less than an hour after the reports of this explosion, where it started to look a little suspicious because the death toll had jumped from 200 to 800. That no one had actually had time to count 800 bodies at right. that point in what was still a very chaotic scene. And so it's it's also things like that where something seems too too pat or too neat. Uh, and, and things are rarely neat in this conflict. As we're speaking today on Wednesday, um, American President Biden is in the region. And I guess my question before we get to what he's working on there is, how has the debate over the hospital attack, accident, misfire impacted the timing of his visit to the region and perhaps the tone of it? It cast a pall over the region. Uh, you know, the the debate over exactly what happened at Ahli Hospital is, of course, it's an important discussion, but uh, it also, in some ways, didn't matter in the region. The The narrative here was immediately fixed that this was an Israeli airstrike and, and people responded as such and didn't matter what the Israeli army said or didn't, said, uh, didn't say, uh, that the narrative was fixed. And so uh, we saw protests on Tuesday night in the occupied West Bank, in Jordan, Lebanon, even as far away as Tunisia, the region uh, was really boiling after news of of this uh, explosion at the hospital. Uh, 
Biden, after visiting Israel, had been scheduled to fly to Jordan, where he was going to hold a, a four-way meeting with the King of Jordan, President Sisi of Egypt, and President Abbas, the Palestinian president. Uh, president Abbas backed out of that summit shortly after uh, the reports from the hospital. Uh, and then the Jordanian government decided to cancel the summit altogether. And so this visit that was meant to be, on the one hand, a show of solidarity with Israel, but on the other hand, an effort to do some high-level diplomacy with Arab leaders, ended up being only the former. Uh, so it, it substantively affected the visit. And then uh, certainly, I think, in terms of the optics or the perception in a region where so many people thought and continue to believe that this was an Israeli airstrike, uh, the image of the American president the morning after getting off Air Force One and embracing Israeli officials, uh, it, was, it was not a look that went over well in, in the Middle East. I know one of the focuses of his visit to Jerusalem uh, was to get aid or at least get the Israelis to allow aid to flow into Gaza. I know no journalists are being allowed in. Do we know yet if any progress has been made there and if, you know, words are words, but uh, if the aid will actually flow into the, the area? On paper, there is some progress, but you're exactly right. Words are words, and, and we'll have to see what happens. The backdrop to this, of course, is that since uh, October 7th, since the Hamas attack that, that killed 1,400 Israelis, uh, Israel has put Gaza under a total siege. It hasn't allowed in food, fuel, water, electricity. Uh, it has completely cut off all of the basic necessities that used to uh, flow from Israel into Gaza. Gaza has a second border with Egypt, but uh, that border by mutual agreement between Israel and Egypt, any commercial goods that flow in via Egypt have to be approved by Israel. And mm. so what we've had for 12 days now is nothing coming in via Israel and also nothing being allowed to come in via Egypt. Israel has been adamant and it is still adamant that it will not allow anything into Gaza uh, until the release of the at least 199 Israelis who were being held hostage there. Egypt has been pushing for days for a deal that would allow humanitarian aid to flow over its border and, and that has been blocked because of Israeli opposition. But after President Biden's visit uh, on Wednesday, uh, both the White House and the Israeli government announced that Israel would uh, consent to aid deliveries via Gaza, okay. limited ones. Uh, the, the statement from the Israeli government said food, water, medicine, nothing else to be allowed in. Uh, it will only go to southern Gaza, uh, which is where the Israeli army has told the entire population of Gaza to congregate, to evacuate the north and flee to the south. Uh, and Israel also said that if there were any signs that aid was being uh, diverted to Hamas, that it would block the aid. It's also uh, bombed the Rafah crossing several times mm. over the past 12 days. So there are conditions attached to this. Uh, and then the question is, how long will this go on? First, at what point might Israel say, uh, this aid is being diverted and decide to block it, but also just a logistical question of getting aid uh, across Egypt, across the border into Gaza. Uh, that border crossing is not really equipped to handle huge commercial shipments in the way that the, the border crossings with Israel are. Right. And of course, again, there are concerns about damage at the crossing because of Israeli airstrikes. So I think we have to wait and see over the coming days just how much aid is able to flow across the border. In terms of aid and uh, other humanitarian efforts in the coming days, uh, especially after the initial reports uh, that the hospital had been bombed by the Israelis, we saw some pretty large street protests throughout the Mideast, uh, even in other countries, in Western countries. Does that change the calculus on the part of Israel or the United States in terms of what they're prepared to do next and what they're prepared to allow to reach the Palestinian people? I'm not sure it changes their calculus. My my first reaction on Tuesday night was to think that it would. Uh, Israel has been talking for a week and a half now about uh, a large ground offensive in Gaza, sending mm -hmm. perhaps hundreds of thousands of troops into Gaza to root out Hamas uh, is the, the stated objective here. But there have been concerns that by doing that, it might end up opening other fronts. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Iranian-backed militant group there, as well as Iran itself, have threatened Israel, have said if there is a, a major offensive in Gaza, that we will be forced to intervene. And that has been a concern for the Israeli military, for Israeli politicians. Uh, Hezbollah is a much better equipped group than Hamas. And, and the prospect of having to fight a war on two fronts, one of them with a, a very well-equipped uh, militia in, in Lebanon is, is one that uh, 
the Israeli army uh, was quite nervous about. When the, the explosion happened at the hospital and we saw these scenes of protest across the region, it seemed like it had greatly increased the chances that Iran or, or its allied militias in the region might decide to to get involved, to to join this war, that it, it, it raised the possibility of this becoming a regional conflict. But uh, I'm not sure that that is going to change the calculus on the Israeli side. I think you have a public there that is angry, that is grieving uh, after this, this massacre carried out by Hamas on October 7th. Uh, their political leaders have primed them for a long war and a war that is going to eradicate Hamas. And they're very nervous about uh, looking weak and and backing down from that. And right. so despite how it seemed on Tuesday night, I think for the moment, uh, Israel is still moving ahead as planned. We'll get back to your podcast after this break. Actually, wouldn't it be great if this was your break right here in the podcast you love? You can connect your brand to your target audience with the help of Rogers Sports and Media. As one of Canada's biggest podcast networks, we can help you explore advertising options within this podcast and so many others. It's a chance to showcase your brand to listeners who are passionate about the content they're hearing. Learn more at rogersportsandmedia.com. It's 1986, Newark, and Michael Morrison is offered the opportunity of a lifetime. A new job, a fresh start with a secure future as a cop. But Mike has no idea he's about to join what he calls the biggest gang in America. I'm Saren Jones, and this is Black and Blue Behind the Badge, a story about what happens when you have to pick a side. Follow Black and Blue Behind the Badge on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. As we speak now, a Wednesday afternoon, Toronto time, uh, late at night, I think, where you are, is there a tipping point to come immediately ahead here? Either, you know, Israel uh, proceeds with its ground offensive and potentially expands the conflict to include other militias, uh, other other people in the region, or as several governments and politicians have called for, a, a chance for a ceasefire perhaps emerges. It seems like that's a lot to hope for right now. But, you know, I guess where is the point at which this conflict is either going to escalate or de-escalate? I think a ceasefire is a lot to hope for at this point. I think, again, just given the domestic mood in Israel, it's not just that people are angry. It's not just that the government has prepared the public for a long war. It's also that Israel's entire conception of Hamas has changed over the past 12 days, that until October 7th, Israel viewed it as a threat, but a manageable threat. You know, yes, Hamas had a rocket arsenal, but the impact of those rockets had been largely blunted by the Iron Dome and other uh, air defense systems. Uh, Hamas had a commando wing, but it wasn't seen as being capable of carrying out uh, large-scale attacks. And there was also a belief within the Israeli army uh, that Hamas had lost interest in large-scale confrontation with Israel, that Hmm. it was focused only on trying to preserve its control of Gaza, and that required improving the economy in Gaza, and that required keeping the peace with Israel. And so that was the the conception of Hamas on October 6th. Of course, that all changed on October 7th. And so the view in Israel now is that it's not a manageable threat. It is an intolerable threat on Israel's borders. And uh, a wide swath of Israeli society, I would say, supports the idea of, of a ground offensive to try and root out, eradicate Hamas. So I think a ceasefire is unlikely. I think the the tipping point, as you say, uh, is likely to be this ground offensive uh, whenever it happens. Uh, we have heard, again, threats from across the region that that is a red line, that there will be some response to that. Uh, and we're going to see whether or not those are, are serious threats and whether or not this expands into a broader regional conflict. Do we have any idea what that ground offensive might look like? Any previous examples from this conflict? Is this unprecedented? Give us an idea of what might happen on the ground. I, this would be unprecedented, I think. There have been, since 2007, which is when Hamas uh, took power in Gaza, there have been two very limited Israeli uh, ground incursions into the territory, one during the 2008-2009 the war, uh, and then another one in 2014 uh, during the long 50-day war in the summer of 2014. And to compare to that that past war in 2014, Israeli troops were on the ground for only about 18 days of those 50 days inside of Gaza. Uh, they stayed within a couple of kilometers, for the most part, of the border between Israel and Gaza. Uh, 
Uh, and they had a very narrow mission, which was to try and find and destroy cross-border attack tunnels that Hamas had dug from Gaza into Israel. Right. Uh, that was it. That was the, the extent of the ground operation. What's being talked about now uh, is something much bigger. The, the battle plans that Israeli generals have been drawing up, the, I think the basic idea would be to send in several divisions worth of troops to bisect Gaza at its narrowest point. It's a, a long but narrow territory. So to bisect Gaza uh, and then to go probably neighborhood by neighborhood through northern Gaza, uh, looking for leaders of Hamas, looking for uh, weapon stockpiles, uh, looking for the network of underground tunnels that Hamas has within Gaza, which it uses uh, as as bunkers and, and weapon storage depots uh, and uses to hide out from the Israeli military during times of conflict. Uh, that would be the idea. And so it will look like house to house, street to street uh, urban combat that will probably be very slow, that will be very costly uh, in terms of human lives on both sides. Uh, you know, when you talk to military analysts, they make comparisons to the Battle of Fallujah during the American occupation of Iraq or the fighting in, in places like Mosul during the campaign against Islamic State, uh, talking about campaigns that went on for a long time that were very destructive uh, and that were very costly in terms of human life. If Israel's goal in this conflict is to eradicate Hamas and this ground offensive is how they're going to do it, to put it bluntly, is that even possible? It seems like going house to house through an entire region is a tall order, even for obviously the superior military force. It is a tall order, and there are a lot of questions about how you even describe or define defeating Hamas. You yeah. can go and, and attempt to decapitate the group to either kill or arrest its leaders. You can uh, destroy weapons stockpiles so that the group's military capacity is degraded. But there's a very real possibility that after you do all of that, that the next day when the war ends, uh, survivors, both members of the group and people who sympathize with the group, uh, go on to reconstitute it and, and try to bring it back into power in Gaza. And that gets at a bigger question, which is what is the plan for the day after? Who takes control of Gaza if you hmm. take away Hamas, which is a militant group, but is also the, the de facto government of this territory? What fills the void? And the options, when you talk to people in the Israeli military, they admit there are no good options here. Uh, one is for Israel to reoccupy the territory indefinitely, which was the case between 1967 and 2005. Uh, that is not something the Israelis particularly want to do. They could leave and leave behind a power vacuum, but there is a, a long history in the Middle East of militant groups filling power vacuums. Uh, there's been some talk of trying to bring the Palestinian Authority, uh, which has uh, some governing responsibilities in the occupied West Bank, trying to bring it back to Gaza as it was until 2007 when Hamas uh, threw it out and took control. But uh, the PA is so weak at this point that it doesn't even control the entire West Bank. And I think it's very far-fetched that it would be able to go back into Gaza and assert control there. So there are no realistic options for the day after. And, and I'm not sure that anyone at the highest levels of the Israeli government uh, really has a plan for that. The last thing I want to ask you about is what happens in the coming days and what you'll be watching for if this ground offensive does go forward. And I am not trying to be hyperbolic. And unfortunately, this is the uh, second time in two years I've now had to ask this question seriously uh, about a conflict to an expert in the region. How likely is it that other nations get involved? And are we looking at a potential uh, multi-nation or world war here? It's a very hard thing to say. Of course. If you take the case of Hezbollah in Lebanon. I can give you an argument for why they would get involved, which is that there is now 12 days worth of rhetoric about supporting the Palestinians that's come from Hezbollah. And uh, if there is a large ground offensive that causes even more death and destruction in Gaza, uh, at some point they have to turn that rhetoric into action or uh, they risk looking weak and, and looking feckless. And, and there's also a possibility that Iran, which backs both Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, would want to open a second front to take some of the pressure off of Hamas and, and try to perhaps allow it to survive in Gaza. So I can give you those reasons why it, it might get involved, but I can also give you reasons why Hezbollah may not get involved, mm -hmm. uh, one of which is the domestic situation in Lebanon right now. It's about four years into one of the worst economic crises in modern history. Right. And there is a, a broad agreement in Lebanon, regardless of, of people's politics, there is broad agreement uh, 
that people do not want the country to be dragged into a war. And so Hezbollah, if it were seen as dragging Lebanon into this war, uh, would face really unpredictable political consequences in Lebanon. You could also argue that Iran is looking at Gaza, looking at Hamas, at the possibility that Hamas will be removed from power. Uh, and it decides, you know what, we don't want to risk Hezbollah as well. We don't want to risk our most powerful, most influential militia in the region. And so it urges Hezbollah not to get involved. So you can analyze it both ways. And, and it's very hard to say which way they're going to decide. I'm not even sure if they have made that decision yet. So we're waiting right now. We're, we're waiting to see when the Israelis launch a ground invasion, how big it is, uh, whether they go in all at once or they try to do it in stages uh, in a way that might be less inflammatory, that might create less pressure for uh, other militia groups in the region to respond. Uh, we have to wait and see uh, how, how severe the, the death and damage is in Gaza during the ground invasion. We don't know. We, we really don't know. But everyone in the region, hundreds of millions of people in this region, uh, are really waiting on tenterhooks right now because they're nervous about what seems like a very real possibility that this will expand. Greg, thank you so much for this, uh, for the analysis and your thoughts, and uh, continue to do the work you do. Thank you. My pleasure. Greg Karlstrom, Middle East correspondent for The Economist. That was The Big Story. For more, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. If you're interested in our latest show, In This Economy, the trailer for it is out today. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for it on your favorite podcast app or pop into the show notes for this episode and click the link. You'll find it there. We have a little teaser coming up in that feed next week. And new episodes will start November 2nd. I really hope you'll check it out. It will be fun for me to discuss things that aren't the news. On that note, if you have any feedback for this show, any feedback after you listen to the trailer for In This Economy, any questions, comments, concerns, story suggestions, whatever, feedback from listeners is my favorite thing about hosting a news podcast. And you can find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. You can email us, hello, at TheBigStoryPodcast.ca. And you can call us at 416-935-5935 and let us know what you think about any old thing. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. Hey, it's Tara Jean. I hope you're enjoying Heaven Bent. I'm here to tell you how to get ad-free bonus content and early access to episodes right now. All you need to do is subscribe to Heaven Bent Plus on Apple Podcasts. When you subscribe, you get to be the first to hear new episodes, all ad-free, You'll also hear exclusive behind-the-scenes interviews and other bonus content. And you'll be supporting this work, so I can continue giving you future seasons of Heaven Bent. Follow the link in the show notes to subscribe. If you like Heaven Bent, you'll love Heaven Bent Plus.